thanks everybody for being here today. We're so excited at this new opportunity for e-learning that we can all get together when we're so far apart. Um, I wanna give a huge shout out to all of our instructors that have put in all the time and such a short time to make this happen. Um, if you haven't been on our website in the last few weeks, I recommend jumping back on there. So we have added a bunch of new um, presentations on there. And we have also added um, the Engaging Young Collectors recording from last year. We're also working on adding the counterfeit detection, the gradings, and the other classes that have happened last week if you didn't get to see them, so jump on there to check those out. I will share the link at the end of the presentation. Um, during the presentation, you may come up with some questions. If you do, feel free to use the chat button or the Q&A questions um, on your screen. Um, the questions will come in to me and I will share them with Doug and Richard at the end of the presentation or in the middle when they wherever they decide. Um, if we can't get to all of the questions today, then I will send them to the presenters to answer and then we'll email them out to you. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will be sending out a survey. If you'll help by answering that, it'll help us to better our presentations in the future and give any feedback back to the instructors as needed. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Doug Mudd and Richard Horst. They're going to be um, teaching on introduction to early U.S. paper currency, 1765 to 1865. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the eLearning Academy. Um, as Brianna said, today we're, we'll be introducing the topic of early paper money in America, which is based on a course that we taught in the last, uh, last summer seminar. Uh, the original course consisted, consisted of 22 hours of classroom instruction over four days. So what we're pre presenting today is a drastically reduced uh, version, essentially a teaser for what we hope uh, you can experience at some future summer seminar. So please come out if you get a chance. Uh, Dick and I have, been, have decided to focus in detail on just a, a couple of the elements of what we would normally cover in the full course rather than attempt to do a very general overview. Uh, it, it wouldn't make much sense just to have a couple of minutes over these large areas. So in our opinion, we, we wouldn't be able to do justice to the history and vast amount of material produced during this era from 1690 to 1866. Sorry, the dates are a little bit off here. We have previously conducted full courses on finances of the Civil War alone, so you can understand how uh, we have to uh, cut this back a little bit. We hope you enjoy the program and understand that, and please understand that of necessity, the presentation cannot cover the entire subject in detail. We will have two opportunities during this presentation for participants to ask questions, one at the end of part one and one at the end of part two. Please send your questions in via ch the chat function and we will attempt to answer them during the breaks. Without further ado, let's begin the class. All right. So first off, got to get the, there we go. So paper money, uh, we're going to start out with a, a, a general discussion of money and paper money and how it started and, and how it leads up to United States paper money. But paper money has become the mainstay of modern currencies throughout the world. Some countries have abandoned coinage altogether due to the cost of producing coins and to, due to economic instability. This reliance on paper money is a far cry from the situation at the beginning of the 20th century when gold in the form of bullion or as coinage predominated as the basis for most of the world's money. International trade and payments were made through the transfer of gold coins and bullion whose value was based on, the on their intrinsic gold content, not on any value set by an issuing government. Banknotes were considered, at best, a substitute uh, for real money of coin gold, and most paper was directly backed by gold. The use of paper money was historically related to shortages of metal for coins, and the earliest money that we know of uh, originated in China around the 7th century AD during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, these came in the form of privately issued bills of credit or exchange notes with date limitations. During the 10th century, the Song Dynasty, short of copper for coins, issued the first generally circulating notes. Well, paper money as we know it was invented when the Jin Dynasty in China began issuing the exchange certificates without a date limitation in 1189. Uh, the Mongols, uh, who formed a dynasty after the conquering of China in from 1206 to 1367, used paper money exclusively. Uh, they even got rid of all of the coins that were being issued at the time um, in order to, to A, save money, but also to simplify their system of currency. They, 
the Ming Dynasty ended the issue of paper money in 1455 in an effort to end the hyperinflation inflation and regain control over the monetary system, which had been thrown into uh, complete disarray by uh, overprinting of paper. Uh, as we go forward in time, we get to Europe, and in Europe, in the in the West, the first uh, country to issue paper money was Sweden in the form of the Stockholms Banco, which was a bank not part of the Swedish government, but closely associated with the Swedish government, uh, which issued the first Western banknotes in 1660. These banknotes became popular because they were much easier to handle than the large copper dollar coins. And I say this with parentheses, uh, these coins uh, weighed up to uh, 60 or 70 pounds, and some of them were up to two feet long. Uh, they had been forced on the, on the Swedes uh, by their king in order to save silver for the, the wars that Sweden was fighting at that time. Sweden had become a major power. So the paper money uh, simplified the, the operation and control of their monetary system and made it much simpler to actually make payments within the country. Uh, it was said that uh, uh, it would take a horse to carry all the copper necessary to purchase a horse with the, the old copper plates. So uh, the, the problem with the system though was that as with the early uh, banknotes across Europe, uh, they overprinted the notes and the, the public lost confidence in them. So other European nations went through the similar experiences during the late 17th and early 18th century. In many cases, the experience so traumatized the nations involved that the use of paper money was delayed for many decades. Countries such as England learned through the experience of, experiences of others and were able to introduce paper money as a permanent feature of their currency. Uh, in England, uh, the Bank of England issued their first notes in 1694, which became the first permanently uh, circulating series of banknotes in the world. Now, uh, that brings up the question of what is money and, and how, how we get to uh, something like paper from a, a point where we think of money as being gold or silver coins or today paper money uh, issued by the government. But money does not have to be based on gold or silver and it was not always made of paper. It was also made of many other things. Uh, it might be hard to imagine a world without currency as we know it, but for most of human existence, trade within communities and regions was handled without coins or paper money. Many types of objects have been used as money, from carved stones to feathers uh, to uh, all sorts of other objects, including teeth. The only requirements were that the objects be reasonably available and durable so they could represent value. So what is money? A simple definition is that money is anything that people will accept as payment in exchange of in exchange for goods or services. Virtually anything can be considered money as long as it performs what we call the three major functions. The, uh, they must be able to be a store of wealth, they must be exchangeable, and they must have some uh, durability to them so that they, they don't disappear through getting wet or something else like that. The four most relevant types of money are commodity money, fiat money, fiduciary money, and commercial bank money. Commodity money relies on intrinsically valuable commodities such as gold or silver or uh, shells or other things that act as a medium of exchange. Fiat money, on the other hand, gets its value from a government order. The government determines that something is worth a certain amount and they decree that it is, and you must accept it that way. Meanwhile, fiduciary money depends for its value on the confidence that it will generally be accepted as a medium of exchange. Commercial bank money can be described as claims against financial institutions that can be used to purchase goods or services. So now we get to the American colonies and the beginnings of uh, US or American money. At various, time, at various times and places in the colonies, uh, such items as to tobacco, rice, sugar, beaver, skins, wampum, and country pay all served as money. And this was because, uh, unlike with the Spanish colonies, 
when the English colonists came to North America, they did not find large uh, sources of silver or gold. Uh, there were none on the eastern seaboard except a, a little bit of gold that was found later on. So rather than getting rich quick, which is what a lot of them hoped to do, they were forced to find other ways to uh, to make money and to make a living. Uh, that also meant that they had to come up with some form of money for use amongst themselves. At the time in Europe, the uh, economic rule of the day was that gold and silver were hard currency. They were real money. Nothing else was really considered to be true money. And uh, as a nation, you formed colonies in order to get richer. You formed colonies so that the colonies could support your nation and make it a richer nation. And that meant shipping all the gold and silver you could to the home country and restricting the export of gold and silver to the outside. Uh, in practical terms for the colonists, this meant that very little silver or gold was allowed to leave England, uh, which meant the colonists were stuck trying to make do. Thus, the use of beaver skins, wampum, and, and all sorts of other items. Uh, the, these items were generally accorded a special monetary status by the various by various acts of the colonial legislature, uh, excuse me, legislatures. So in Massachusetts, for example, they issued tables as early as the 1630s, which uh, stated the value of wampum versus nails versus beaver skins so that they could collect taxes. And then uh, also so that merchants could have a set uh, value for different commodities in trade. When you don't have any coins, it becomes necessary to do such a thing. Sugar was used in the British Caribbean, tobacco was used in the Chesapeake, rice in South Carolina, each being the central product of their respective plantation economies. Uh, wampum, which was the stringed shell beads used by Native Americans as money before the arrival of European settlers, was used throughout the Northeast and in other parts of the, of the pre-colonial uh, North American hinterland. Uh, they, were, they were used along with beaver skins in the northern colonies in the early stages of settlement and right up through the early 1700s actually. Uh, in part their value, especially for the, the beaver skins, was based on the fur trade with Europe where beaver fur was an extremely uh, desirable commodity and worth quite a bit of money. Um, Country pay is a little bit more complicated. Where it was used, country pay consisted of, of a hodgepodge of locally produced agricultural commodities that had been monetized by the colonial legislatures. A list of commodities such as Indian corn, beef, pork, etc., were, assi were assigned specific monetary values, and debtors were permitted by statute to pay certain debts with their choice of these commodities at nominal values set by the le legislature. This commodity system had, a major, had major drawbacks, as you can imagine. Quality control, rot, damage, uh, all played a part in uh, making the use of this country pay less than ideal, especially if you had to store the money for any time at all. Now we'll move on to the first colonial paper money. It was in the English colonies where paper money found its most enthusiastic supporters and where the look and form of modern paper money was developed. American colonists had no ready sources for gold or silver, nor could they get sufficient money for their needs from England. So paper money became an attractive alternative. Massachusetts, the largest and most economically developed of the early colonies, became the first to issue paper currency in 1690. Here's an example of one of those notes. It's a, uh, it's actually Interestingly, an altered note, because none of the original notes actually survive in their original form. This note is written out for 20 shillings. It originally was written for two shillings, six pence, but an enterprising individual altered the, the very few, I think there's four or five of these that are surviving today, uh, to 20 shillings. And they survive today because they were recognized as counterfeits at the time 
So they got put into a drawer or, or stored somewhere instead of being turned in and destroyed by the legislature. But as you can see, it's very clear on what, what it's for. This indented bill, indentures, by the way, are the curved uh, lines at the top of the note, uh, which were designed, well, which are the result of being cut out of a bound book. The idea was that you could uh, prevent counterfeiting to some degree by matching the uh, curved line of the cut with the book where it was cut out from. And if it matched, it meant that this note came from that book. Uh, so this indented bill of 20 shillings is due from the Massachusetts colony to the possessor, shall be in value equal to money and shall accordingly be accepted by the treasurer and received subordinate to him and receivers subordinate to him in all public payments and for any stock at any time in the treasury. Boston in New England, February the 3rd, 1690, by order of the general courts. Uh, and then it's signed by uh, several people, uh, all of them officials in the government, basically as promises that you could go to them and they would see that you got reimbursed. Uh, the reason why these notes were issued was interesting and indicative of why paper money started in the first place in most cases. They are a result of emergencies. In this case, uh, in 1690, during King William's war, war the um, English, the English government decided to invade Canada, which was a French colony at the time. And Massachusetts, in a fit of enthusiasm, decided to join in and called out the militia. And the militia were excited because they, they figured that this is an easy way to get some plunder from their northern neighbors. And uh, they formed and went north uh, on a few ships. Unfortunately, uh, the ships were hit by a storm. Uh, several were sunk, including those that had the payroll. And the uh, militia eventually returned home armed with muskets and without any money and a bit angry and disappointed. Uh, they got to the General Assembly. The Assembly uh, had to come up with some sort of answer to pay these guys. They knew that the ship from England with silver was on its way. So they came up with the idea of issuing the first government issued paper money in the Western world. Uh, the system actually worked very well. The notes were used in circulation and then redeemed quite successfully. In fact, they were so successful that the other colonies soon followed suit. And basically by 1740, all of the uh, colonies had begun issuing paper, uh, not all with quite the same success, but all for uh, good reason and uh, in order to help their continuing shortage of uh, real or coinage money. By 1740, Rhode Island notes were, uh, well, I'm sorry. By 1715, 10 of the 12 existing uh, colonies, Georgia was only founded in 1733, had issued paper currency with varying degrees of success. Um, the success depended on what the paper money was backed by. In many cases, it was backed by land speculation, which uh, turned out to be a bad idea. Uh, speculators and speculation in land that hadn't been surveyed or was only roughly surveyed could cause serious problems to the value of your notes. Um, but there were other systems that did work. And overall, the general picture became one in which the British government decided that they needed to control the value of uh, the notes. Uh, in part, this is because British merchants were being asked to receive colonial notes and they were unwilling to do so, but the English colonists had little else to offer other than the, than the commodities produced in the, in the colonies, uh, which were not always desirable to the English merchants. So uh, in 1751, there was a the first of a series of acts which restricted the use of paper money in the colonies, um, in particular the New England colonies. These colonies had issued paper bills of credits to help pay for military expenses during the, the earlier of the French and Indian Wars. 
because more paper money was issued than, the, than what was taxed out of circulation, the currency depreciated in relation to the British pound sterling. The future issues of bills of credit was limited, allowing the existing bills to be used as legal tender for public debts until they were paid off by the taxes, current taxes. And uh, this created a bit of a, of a monetary crisis for the colonies because they didn't have enough money in circulation to meet all of their economic needs. And this led to, uh, in part, to what became the American Revolution. Uh, the Currency Act of 1764 extended the earlier acts to all of the British colonies in North America. Unlike the earlier acts, this, this statute did not permit, prohibit the colonies from issuing paper money, but it did forbid them from designating future currency issues as legal tender for public and private debts. This was in direct response to the, the uh, request of English merchants not to be forced to take uh, American colonial paper money. This tight monetary policy created fi financial difficulties for the colonists. These bills of credit were notes issued by provincial governments that were often uh, used as le legal tender in the payment of debts. Bills of credit were ordinarily put into circulation in one of two ways. The most common method was for the colony to issue bills to pay, to pay for projects and debts uh, incurred while they purchased things for the running of the government. Bills of credit were originally designed as a kind of tax anticipation. They were issued to pay for current expenditures and allow a, con a colony to uh, levy taxes over the next several years to pay back those bills so that they could be destroyed. A second method was for the colony to lend new newly printed bills on land security, land speculation in other words, at attractive interest rates through a land bank. The, these land banks became a major problem and were specifically banned by the British soon afterwards because of in, unscrupulous uh, speculators uh, and the selling of land that didn't exist or perhaps was not quite as uh, advertised. So here's some examples of these notes. Uh, so a three pound note of, the, of New York, by the law of the colony of New York, this bill shall be received in all payments in the treasury for three pounds, New York, February 16th, 1771. Notice uh, the designs uh, on this. It's got a fairly complicated design. They're all done by woodblock and printing. Uh, the various little miniature pieces of the designs are all there in order to uh, discourage counterfeiting. And counterfeiting is such a problem at the time that as you can see from the note on the <coughs> lower right, there's the message, uh, tis death to counterfeit. So counterfeiting was punishable by death at a time and they made sure that everybody knew that by printing it directly on their notes. Here's an interesting note. It's the back of a note that was issued uh, by New Jersey. It's got what is known as a nature print on it. Uh, nature prints are based on tree leaves, and it turns out that tree leaves have unique uh, prints similar to fingerprints. So you could, uh, by having the master print, compare the lines, uh, the veins in the uh, leaf and determine whether this was a counterfeit or based on the original note. Um, an interesting system, and we'll talk about how that was invented in a second. Again, to counterfeit is death. This is a three shilling note, and it identifies who printed it. It has a border that's designed to make it difficult to hand copy. Here's a five shilling note. Uh, this is uh, issued by Pennsylvania. And according to the Act of General Assembly of Pennsylvania, passed in the 13th year of the reign of His Majesty George III, dated the first day of October 1773. So this is on the eve of the revolution. Notice that many colonies, Pennsylvania among them, used the reign date of the, the current king as part of their dating. 
And then the reverse of another note, also, uh, it's actually the reverse of this note. It's to counterfeit his death, five shillings with a nice scene on the back, an agricultural scene uh, designed with enough detail in it to make it much more difficult to copy by hand. With that, we will move on to a really interesting side note about US paper money, the, the earliest paper money uh, that had one of our founding fathers involved with it. Benjamin Franklin was a printer, as many of us know, and he one of the big jobs that he and his family had as a printing house was the printing of paper money. Now, printing in the American colonies was uh, only a recent development. The first uh, printing presses only appeared in the colonies in the 1630s and only in Massachusetts at what became Harvard University. Uh, and it wasn't until, interestingly enough, the 1690s that printing presses started to become relatively common. Before 1690, there were only four printing presses in the American colonies. Uh, after 1690, uh, they started pr to proliferate pretty quickly. And it's no accident that the introduction of paper currency co coincided with the increased availability of printing presses and the first paper mill in the colonies. The first paper mill was actually started in Massachusetts, uh, well, in New England, and uh, was printing paper for use at Harvard University because they needed the paper to conduct their studies. Uh, it, it soon diversified into printing uh, paper money and money for paper money and paper for paper money, excuse me. Now, Franklin first began to impact the world of numismatics in the late 1720s. He printed money for several of the British colonial governments, starting with New Jersey in 1728, followed by Delaware and Pennsylvania in the 1730s. Franklin even wrote a treatise on the defense of paper money issues in 1729 entitled A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of Paper Money. His involvement in the paper money business continued through the 1740s until he retired from printing in 1746. Even then, his name continued to appear on Pennsylvania notes as the partner of David Hall, uh, who was the successor to the Franklin printing business that uh, he'd founded. In this field, as in all of his endeavors, Franklin brought his creativity to bear and created improvements in the production of paper money designed to make them more difficult to counterfeit. His major innovation was the in invention of nature printing um, using various leaves to create a unique print for each series of notes. The technique was used in the notes of New Jersey until the late 1780s after starting in 1737. Franklin introduced nature printing to Pennsylvania notes in 1739. With the beginning of the American Revolution, Franklin once again got involved in the issue of money, in this case as the originator of designs and slogans to be used on paper money issued by the Continental Congress and in the development of a design for a new unit of coinage for the United States. The most famous of Franklin's design is the Fugio design. So here's some examples of his notes. There's one printed by Franklin Hall, I mean, by Benjamin Franklin and, and David Hall, 1764, with a uh, nature print on it. Another one. And then it, arguably his most famous design with the uh, Fugio design. Mind your business. So now we'll go into colonial economics for just a second. Units of account in colonial times were pounds, shillings, and pence based on the English system, where one pound equaled 20 shillings, one shilling equaled 12 pennies. So there would be 12 pennies 20, 240 pennies in one pound. These pound shillings and pence, however, were local units uh, such as, well, what happened was that over time, because of the disparity in the economic uh, development of the different colonies, their local units of account, while denominated as English uh, money, uh, got out of step with the value of English pounds, shillings, and pence. Since the coins themselves 
became much more valuable than the local equivalent in paper, uh, there became a disparity between different colony money and English sterling as it was known. So New York money, Pennsylvania money, Massachusetts money, or South Carolina, South Carolina money uh, should not be confused with sterling values. Uh, to, do, to do so is comparable with treating modern Canadian dollars and American dollars as interchangeable simply because they are both called dollars. All the local currencies were less valuable than English sterling. A Spanish piece of eight, for an instance, was worth four shillings, six pence in sterling. Um, that was a standard value that it, 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 they held for uh, a couple of centuries, actually. The same piece of eight on the eve of the revolution would have been treated as six shillings in New, in New England, as eight shillings in New York, as seven shillings, six pence in Philadelphia, and as 32 shillings, six pence in Charleston, South, South Carolina. It was estimated that up to three quarters of the money supply in the American colonies consisted of paper currency. In spite of the British attempts to limit the colonial uh, issues, uh, so this created a problem in intercolonial trade. It was actually easier to trade directly with England than it was to trade with each other due to the differences in the, the values of the respective monies they were using at the time, which creates interesting situations when you have colonies that are within a, a couple hundred miles of each other, and yet uh, they're, they find it easier to actually trade with the home country, which was a few thousand miles away. <laughs> now we'll start with the money of the American Revolution. With the start of hostilities in 1775, the colonies began to issue paper money without regards to English restrictions. This money was produced concurrently with a new continental currency, uh, which was being produced in Philadelphia based on the Spanish mill dollar. Interestingly, not all colonies were initially willing to formally break with the political ties of the past. After all, most colonists were not yet prepared to renounce their English citizenship and believe that peace could be made once Britain realized the error of its ways. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Philadelphia, I mean, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York retained the practice of dating their issues by the reign of George III. Georgia even retained a crown on some of its issues. All of the colonies eventually modified their notes to reflect more patriotic themes after the Declaration of Independence. Some changed their coats of arms, others started to use Spanish dollars in place of English pounds, pence, shillings uh, to denominate their notes. And others uh, simply added the Spanish mill dollars as part of their uh, denomination. So you'd have doubly denominated notes. So. This is just some introductory pieces here. So you get a continental currency note for $4 on the left, and then you get a note of, uh, boy, the state of Connecticut. So it's Hartford, Connecticut, um, showing you the different looks for them. Uh, there's the state of Massachusetts uh, note. It's basically a tax receipt and the uh, Vermont currency. We'll go on to the details. Starting with continental currency, continental notes were issued by the resolutions of the Continental Congress, starting with their first meeting on May 10th, 1775. This, this res resolution was followed by 10 more up until January 14th, 1779, when the issues were discontinued due to rampant inflation and the loss of public confidence in the series. Remarkably, despite the lack of specie, uh, you know, the, the colonies were chronically short of any hard currency. They didn't have silver or gold and the coins were not coming in, in part because it was very difficult to conduct trade with the Caribbean co uh, colonies in the, uh, of Spain, where most of our silver was coming from. Uh, the Continental Notes held their value for the first 18 months of their existence, reflecting the extraordinary support that Continental, the Continental Congress initially had, especially considering they did not have the power of direct taxation. They could only tax the colonies themselves, not the citizens. Uh, and many of the colonies were unwilling or unable to meet their obligations to the common cause. Um, 
and without any direct sources of silver or gold, it exacerbated the problems the colonies themselves had in running their own governments. So we'll start out with a half dollar. This is the famous note with the designs by uh, Benjamin Franklin. So according to a resolution of Congress passed in Philadelphia, February 17, 1776, mm -hmm. one of the things to note is the uh, design itself. It's uh, got a lot of complicated elements on the edges, all designed to make it harder to counterfeit. But also, this is a half dollar note. So this is a small enough denomination note that it was intended for use in regular circulation. A half dollar at this time was more than you could make in a day of labor, but it was small enough that it was something that the average person would use for larger purchases. Uh, so these notes are intended for the average person to some extent to be able to use. There were also one third of a dollar, two thirds of a dollar, uh, and other uh, denominations which seem sort of strange <laughs> to us until you realize that if you convert the dollar into English pounds and shillings at four shillings, uh, four shillings, six pence for a dollar, a third of a dollar and two thirds of a dollar actually work out in even numbers for shillings and pence. So printed by Holland Sellers, which is a successor company of Benjamin Franklin's original printing business. And again, a Franklin uh, inspired design, the famous uh, design used on the continental dollar of 1776. So you have the names of all of the colonies joined in a ring and American Congress, we are one at the center. The next nomination is the $4 note that we saw already. Now you read what it says and it says, the, this bill entitles the bearer to receive four Spanish milled dollars or their value thereof in gold or silver according to the resolutions of the Congress held at Philadelphia. Remember the Philadelphia was the, the capital of the colonies at the time. The 10th of May, 1775. It's got nature printing on the back printed by Holland Sellers. And notice that it says that this note is payable in Spanish mill dollars or gold or silver. Uh, the hope by the government, of course, was that these notes would not be turned in too soon because they didn't have the gold or silver to redeem them. Uh, patriotism was what was expected to hold this up, this system. $5, so a $5 note, similar in design. You've got $8. I'm not gonna show every single denomination, but this gives you an idea of the different denominations as they went on. You have $20. So the $20 is a significant amount of money for the time. If it was real, money in the form of coins or silver and gold, this is something that an, an average person wouldn't be able to make in less than a, two or three months of work, perhaps. It's quite a bit of money. A $30 bill, this is 1777, so it's still fairly early. The, the uh, notes have, have only just started to depreciate so you're starting to see some of these higher, higher denominations to make up for it. So if, if a uh, continental dollar is worth uh, only 60 cents on the dollar in Spanish uh, coinage, then it makes sense to, to produce higher denomination bills to try to, to purchase things from the uh, colonists for supplies for the army, things like that. Then you get to the, 1779, and you have a $40 bill. Now, as you can see, the continental currency was dis discontinued in 1779. So uh, by that time, inflation had hit so, so much that the notes 
were dropping in value to a tenth or less of their face value, uh, which meant it was increasingly hard to find anything you could purchase with the notes. Doug, this is an example of a remainder note which has no signatures and no serial number. Yep, and, th and that's one reason why this note is in such good shape. You'll notice that many of the notes that are in bad shape, what that means is that they circulated quite a bit. Uh, in the world of paper money, especially in the colonial period, what you'll find is that the later notes in particular, continental currency and stuff, are in better shape than earlier notes because they had lost so much value that they ended up getting thrown into drawers and not redeemed, and they didn't circulate much as opposed to the earlier notes, which are generally found in much worse condition. So here's a $40 note. Then we have $45. This one was actually issued, and it's got two, well, three signatures on it. Here's another unissued note. And here's a particularly interesting note. Uh, what's really interesting here is if you look carefully, it's a $55 note, except that if you look on the right-hand side of the note, it's got two counters on the left and the right, uh, two extra uh, areas of printing. And the one on the right in very ornate writing says $35. And if you look at the back of the note, you'll see at the bottom, it's got $35 as well. So this is a double denominated note. It's an error. And it shows you two things. First off, they didn't pay attention too much uh, in order to allow this to pass. I mean, this was actually issued. It was signed by two of the issuers and circulated. But it also talks to us about how notes were printed. So colonial notes, including continental currency notes, were printed in sheets that were mixed sheets. So they would have uh, a sheet of paper, they would put different denominations on them and build them uh, so that as much paper was used as possible. So they, they made them like a puzzle almost. They would fit different notes in and different angles and different uh, positions in order to maximize the use of the paper and used, they would use different denominations again to maximize the use of the paper, which was relatively expensive, and in order so that they could print the higher denominations in particular in smaller numbers. They, they didn't want to have a whole bunch of 55s all on one sheet, so they mixed them with smaller denominations. And the result was this interesting piece, an error note that was actually issued and circulated somewhat. It's in pretty good shape, but clearly a 55 and a 35. If it had been redeemed, I wonder what they would have done. 45. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cut it in the middle. 45. Then we get a $60 note, standard. Again, it has the, the nature printing, and it's redeemable in Spanish mill dollars or in gold or silver. $65. And I'll stop at $70. The highest denomination that was actually printed were $80 notes of the same January of uh, 1779 resolution. Uh, these higher denomination notes of the last series basically reflect the severity of the inflation that hit, had hit the continental currency by this time. Um, so shortly thereafter, the notes were discontinued and uh, became a problem of the next few decades. Uh, continental currency notes were not finally redeemed until uh, the early 19th century. And when they were redeemed, they were redeemed officially at one cent on the dollar. So anybody that was still holding them uh, could have redeemed them at that time, but it was hardly worth doing so because they would have had to travel to the nearest treasury office, which often wouldn't have been very close for a, for a very small amount of money. Now we'll get to the state currency. 
I'll start with one of the most interesting pieces, one of my favorite pieces from the colonial period, and that's this Maryland note that was issued in several denominations, but two thirds of a dollar, in this case, one dollar and one third of a dollar. Uh, what's interesting about this is that this note is a, an early piece of propaganda relating to the revolution. So it's got the standard uh, messaging of the time, one dollar, one third of a dollar, this bill of one dollar and one third shall entitle the bearer hereof to receive gold and silver at the rate of four shillings and six pence sterling per dollar for the said bill, according to a resolve of the Provincial Convention of Maryland, held at the city of Annapolis on the 26th day of July, 1775. It's got a crown at the start, so it's showing that it's still loyal to the British crown, yet the message in the illustrations is very different. What it shows is a American colony being bombarded by British ships. It's hard to see in here, but you can see a ship on the left-hand side in outline. Uh, the town is being burned. Uh, it shows King George uh, at center with a torch, putting the torch to the town. While next, and, and while he's trampling on the Magna Carta below, you can see M. Carta just below his foot. Um, the Magna Carta was essentially the Bill of Rights for the British. Uh, it was a, a bill that protected the individual rights of Englishmen from their government. They had certain rights uh, to a trial of their peers, things like this. So George III is trampling the Magna Carta with regards to the American colonists. Then you have um, Britannia receiving the... Uh, receiving, let's see, uh, a petition. And meanwhile, Liberty is holding the Liberty cap, uh, trampling on slavery, i.e. the slavery imposed by England on the American colonies, while being followed by troops carrying a flag with the first three letters of Liberty on it. So this note is definitely uh, seditious in the sense of complaining about what's going on and really not showing that Maryland is not very happy with the English, but at the same time is following the basic forms of normal colonial money. Um, so we move on to some of the other notes of the time. Here we have a note of Pennsylvania. Now, it's still using three pence, so it's using the British system, but now uh, it's the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania issuing uh, the notes. And it's printed in, by John Dunlop in Philadelphia. Very standard, looks very much like the previous notes, but without reference to the king. In Georgia, they issued these notes uh, this certificate entitles the bearer to two Spanish milled dollars or value thereof, according to resolution of Congress. And they're using Spanish milled dollars as opposed to the less patriotic English currency of the time. One of the things that's interesting about these notes and uh, other notes, whenever you see color inks appearing on uh, currency this time, that's an anti-counterfeiting device. Colored ink was relatively uh, expensive and harder to find, so it was an effective means to limit the amount of counterfeiting that could be done. Then we have a North Carolina note uh, issued by the authority of Congress at Halifax in April 2nd, 1776. $10. A South Carolina note. Here's one of the notes that I just alluded to a little while ago. This is denominated in Spanish mill dollars and in English pound shilling pence. So on the, on the reverse, you can see, and at the bottom of the, the, uh, the front of the note, it says four, four pounds, 17 shillings, six pence. 
for three Spanish mill dollars. Again, this is another partial. Yep. Remainder. It's, it's been signed by only one person, which means that it was not fully uh, endorsed and it does not have the uh, serial number. So this is an unissued note. Then we have a 20 shillings note, uh, also issued by Pennsylvania. You can see that this was circulated quite a bit. It's worn and folded. Um, quite a bit of uh, usage was made of this note. It's from 1781. Uh, so it's still technically during the revolution, but hostilities had ended, uh, well, ended by the late 1781. Yet, because the continental currency was no longer uh, in circulation, these notes that were issued by the states came relatively more important because there was still a shortage of silver and gold. Coinage was still as rare as it always had been. So the states had to step up and make new issues. So you'll see a lot of state issues dating from 1780, 1781, and slightly later. Here you have a $25 note from North Carolina, printed by James Davis, printer of the time. In, in the South. Here we have a very well-worn note uh, issued by Vermont. Now, Vermont was an interesting case. They were not a, a, an original colony, but they became a state just at the end of the, the revolution. In, originally, they considered be, becoming independent on their own, but they joined the Union and um, in their case, they were even more isolated than the rest of the colonies because they didn't have a shoreline. They were not actually connected to the ocean. And so relatively speaking, money was even uh, scarcer in their region. And so they had to rely on paper currency more. And generally, Vermont notes will tend to be very well worn of this period because they got used quite a bit. There was no other real easy solution. But interestingly, they're using the English system. So 15 pence or one shilling and three pence. And then we have the state currency with uh, this is Connecticut again, and we have 40 shillings printed in New, New London by Timothy Green, signed on the front and the back. That's supposed to be an R. It's yep. upside down. It might be an anti counterfeiter. Yeah, and as Dick was saying, the possessor of, so you see the possessor, the R is actually upside down, and it's Given its position and everything else, it may be an anti-counterfeiting device versus a mistake. That was a technique that was used quite a bit in early printing. And then we have a Massachusetts note. Now, what's interesting about this note is that it's got a triangle cut out of it. That is a, um, a form of cancellation. So this note was actually issued and then uh, turned in. Obviously, it didn't circulate for very long because it's in great shape. But once it was turned in, it was canceled with this diamond-shaped cut. Um, notice that on the bottom left of the front, it has an interest chart. So this is an interest-bearing note. And it would earn interest annually at the rate of two shillings uh, one pence and uh, that's the quarter pence there. Farthing. A farthing. <clears throat> or monthly at two pence. So another way of denominating the notes. Uh, so this is in seven dollars, but it's in earning interest in an English system, which made it must have made for some interesting math. It sure did. <laughs> 
Now, at the end of the war, money, the paper money is being devalued, not just the uh, continental currency, but also the state issues. And here's an example. Uh, Virginia issued notes up to $500 in value. And uh, these, these notes have an interesting exchange uh, formula on them. $400 shall be exchanged and redeemed in Spanish mill dollars or the value in gold or silver at the rate of one for 40 at the treasury of Virginia on or before the 30th day of December, 170, 1,790. So 10 years after the issue of this note, you could get it redeemed at the rate of one for 40. It's quite a different issue than is $1,200 from the same state. So you can see that uh, they're desperate for money and they're offering very good terms if you're willing to wait a long time. <laughs> uh, they did not actually pay back on these things. And then we have a note from uh, Rhode Island. This note is issued in 1786. So it's technically it's after the revolution, but it follows the same conventions that were used all the way up until the introduction of the Constitution, uh, which is where we will start our next part. Um, so even though this is the period of the Confederation, uh, there was quite a bit of disarray in the monetary system because even though the, the revolution had ended successfully, there were no substitutes for the lack of uh, hard currency still. The nation was trying to figure out what to do next, and its economy was in disarray. Uh, the, the Articles of Confederation signed, endorsed in 1781, uh, created a very weak central government, which was not the sole holder of the power to uh, produce money. The states were left with the power of producing coins and paper currency, with the result that there was a confusion of issues and nobody knew who was responsible for what. Uh, the federal government attempted to issue coinage on a uh, contractual basis, which ended up being a major scandal as various uh, entrepreneurs that were involved uh, ran off with the money basically. <laughs> and uh, it all left a very bad taste. Part of the reason why the constitution was eventually created in order to create a standardized system of money that would enable the country to grow, among other things. And with that, that's the end of part one. If you have any questions, uh, we will answer those questions at this time, uh, as many as we can get to. So we'll, do, we'll take about three or four minutes to do this and then move on to part two. Awesome. So you've had some questions come in, Doug. So I'm just going to um, go down the list and we'll get through a couple of them and then we'll move on. Um, so one I'll start with is um, what, for example, was the day wage in pence and or shillings of a day laborer like the bricklayer or carpenter or wheelwright in 1776 and how much was it in 1789 when Washington died? Uh, actually, I don't have exact numbers for that. Uh, I do know that around 1790, uh, a day labor in, uh, say, Philadelphia, as opposed, it was different in all different colonies because the colonies had different economic levels. Uh, plus, you have to remember that the different colonies used, after independence in particular, they used either Spanish mill dollars and, and the new dollar as their, their standard currency, or they used English, their version of the English sterling. So you've got conversion rate issues, but uh, you know, 10 cents a day in 1790 was a good laborer's wage. Um, I'm not sure what it would have been in 1776. There wasn't a huge change in the economy, the base level economy. But as I said, it, it's difficult uh, without a lot of research to determine that you have to do it region by region, though. Great. Um, real quick, can you talk about what reference books do you use? Um, well, there's a number of reference 
works for the, the paper money itself. So the standard reference is Newman's uh, Money of the American College. Uh, we've got a, a bibliography at the, at the back of the, the end of this presentation that, that gives some of the basic references. Uh, you've got Friedberg's uh, catalog, United States Paper Money, which has uh, information on the colonial notes, at least listing the different types of notes and how they were issued and what their values are. But Newman's work is by far the most important. Uh, Q. David Bowers has written quite a bit on uh, US paper money, including the colonial paper money. It's, it's quite valuable as a reference. All right. Do any of the original indented books still exist or just the notes? Uh, interestingly, a, a few of them do exist. They're mostly in New England colonies. Uh, most of the Southern colonies, uh, in large part due the, to the American Civil War, had their uh, original state houses and, and courthouses burned down by the Union Army as a result of the war. So they lost a lot of their early records. For example, in Virginia, Williamsburg was burned and uh, other uh, colonies lost them through accident. Uh, but in New England, there are a few, I believe uh, you could find some in the Massachusetts Historical Society and, and in some other organizations. But I, I don't have any, any specific ones that I can refer to. Um, why is there so much writing on the bills? Well, one of the interesting things with paper money is since you have a society that, that based the value of its money on silver and gold, people were used to the idea that if you had a gold coin, it was worth, uh, you know, $10 because it had basically close to $10 worth of gold in, in it, $9 and 90 cents worth of gold or something. And the idea that paper money could be valuable in and of itself was, was something that took a long time to accept. So paper money had to have a lot of verbiage to create some confidence. Basically, the, the issuers are saying, hey, we're the issuers, we're important, we've got power. And by the way, four or five or six or seven of us have signed this note. So in, in a world where you could walk through the capitals of the, of the various colonies and run into these legislatures on a regular basis. You know, you're talking a few thousand people. Boston at the time of the revolution was only maybe 10,000 people. So it wouldn't be unusual to run into the colonial legislators and say, hey, why aren't you taking my money? You know, why aren't you paying up on this? So it, it was a way of creating confidence and it was reinforced by the idea, the idea that you could actually identify the individuals that signed the notes and hold them responsible. All right, how many more questions would you like to answer? Let's just take one more and then go on. All right, what year was the first paper money printed? Uh, well, the first paper money in the United States or in, in the Americas, 1690. If, you're, if we're talking about the first money per se, on paper of some sort. We're talking about China sometime during uh, around 700 AD. We don't have any examples of it. What we do have is examples, the earliest examples of paper money that we have were printed on mulberry bark uh, in the 1360s in China. But we don't have any earlier examples. So those are the ones we know for sure. We have references to earlier notes. Great. And with that, yeah, we'll start so we're going to turn it back over to Doug and Richard. If we didn't get to your questions, we'll answer some more at the end. And like I said, if we can't get to them all, I'll be sending them to the instructors to answer at a later date. Okay. Yes, right there. Okay. okay, we're going to talk about uh, obsolete paper money, and I'll call it obsolete currency or just obsolete. 
Um, the term obsolete paper money refers to non-federally issued money used as currency from the earliest days of the federal government up until 1866. The very first obsolete currency was issued by state chartered banks and were known as bank notes or simply notes. It was not long, however, before the dishonest factors realized that counterfeiting was easier and required much less capital than entering into a legitimate banking business. Others realized that <clears throat> start, starting a fictitious or spurious bank with a similar name to a legitimate bank or keeping a legitimate bank but changing the location of the bank to a different city or state would be a profitable enterprise. Things that uh, made this easy is the lines of communication were limited to newspapers and mail delivered by horseback, mail coach, or ship, even between the largest cities until the invention of the telegraph in 1844. So any of these schemes could be carried on without detection for relatively long periods of time. And the further you were out in the country away from big cities, the more easy it was to deceive merchants. Later, private energy entities such as insurance companies, railroads, exporting companies, savings institutions, and other businesses would also be issuing their own currency. Some legitimate, some not. Finally, state and local governments in cases of emergencies would necessity issue their own notes. All the obsolete issuers were stopped in their tracks after the Union won the Civil War and Congress levied a 10% tax on the outstanding issues in 1866. They could either convert to national bank, cease issuing notes or pay the tax. When is it? Technical issue here. Yeah. What just happened? Here. There we go. Okay. Happen? Sorry about that. I don't know. Which one is that? This one? No, it's either one. Oh. Okay. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> uh, yep. obviously, currency in the early era, the early era is 1782 to 1818. And I'll be discussing these a little bit. Uh, individual notes and in an order of which the bank that issued the note uh, came into uh, a being. Um, time period is the federal period from 1782 to 1866. Emergency issues due to financial panics in 1873 and 1893 are not covered. The earliest era for obsolete notes starts in 18, 1782 with the approval by Congress of the Bank of North America in Philadelphia. During the early era, First Bank of the United States was chartered by Congress in 1791, but in 1811, its charter was allowed to lapse, boding ill for the prosecution of the coming war with the British in 1812. During the War of 1812, the government also instituted excise taxes on imports, issued bonds to pay for the war, with some low-value bonds circulating as money. We have some uh, examples to show in the slides of that. During 1818, 1814, banks in Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York suspended specie payments, thus causing coin shortages and sub-dollar paper substitutes called shin plasters to be issued in most states, which lasted until 1818. Second Bank of the United States was chartered in 1816 with raised expectations of a boost in the economy, which didn't materialize until two years after. Big delay. Yeah, me, there mm -hmm. we go. The first uh, bank to issue notes was the Bank of North America located in 1782 with a capital of $400,000. It converted to a national bank of the same name in 1864. The Massachusetts Bank in, eight, in Boston was chartered in 1784 but capital paid in of 253500 when it started on July 5th. It became the Massachusetts National Bank in 1865. The Bank of New York in New York City started in 44 Wall Street on June 9, June 9th, 1784, capitalized with $950,000. It converted to a National Banking Association in 1865. Bank of Maryland in Baltimore finally was chartered in 1790, having waited since applying in, in 18, 1784 with a capital of $300,000. It failed, however, in 1834. 
The Bank of Providence in Rhode Island opened on October 10th, 1791 with a capital of $400,000. It failed in 1857 during the panic that year. The Bank of the United States was established in Philadelphia in 1791. Capital limit was $10, $10 million with $2 million owed, owned by the government and the balance divided into shares of $400 each, with at least 25% payable in gold or silver. Bank charter was allowed to expire in 1811. Banks in the states of South Carolina, New, New Hampshire, Virginia, and Connecticut, and again others, the pre pre previous issuing states followed by the year 1800. Here we have the Bank of North Carolina, and uh, excuse me, the Bank of North America. <laughs> It turns out that this is a counterfeit note, um, and uh, <clears throat> it, it's interesting that um, it has a B uh, letter in the upper right corner, which is a plate position letter, and so there were multiple notes on this, pl this plate that this uh, uh, exhibited. And um, this was came from the uh, Eric Newman collection, a uh, heritage auction goes off um, about five years ago or so. And I'm going to show the back of that. And the back has an equally, um, equally uh, complex design, which turns out to be the initials of the, uh, of the uh, Bank of North America. Now we'll go on to the next slide. Here we have a uh, we have a ten dollar note from the, from the Massachusetts Bank, and uh, it's a seventeen ninety nine issue ten dollar note. It is a counterfeit. There is a notation running vertically um, that is on the back side that says counterfeit. That's the notation. It's bleeding through to the front. Here we have the Bank of Maryland, the post note. Again, it's a counterfeit. It says counterfeit right on the face of it. It's a $20 note, June 1st, 1797. Here we have the Bank of Baltimore, a 1799 $5 note. This is a genuine note out of the uh, Eric Newman collection. It approximately brought $6,000 at auction. These notes are all rare. Uh, some of them uh, are valuable and rare. Here we have the um, First Bank of Boston, $50 note, 1797, at the Boston Office of Discounts and Deposits. <clears throat> there is no notation on this note, but it is a counterfeit. Finally, we have uh, two notes from Albany. We have uh, $5, 1812, Mechanics and Farmers Bank. And we have a $10 note, same bank, 1811. Notice the uh, simplistic uh, look of a lot of these notes. Now this one has a vignette which isn't too bad. Um, and I'm gonna go back to the five. There's another vignette very similar to that one. Uh, it looks more like a line drawing than that one. That looks like a more finished vignette. I think they're the same scene. And then we'll go to the next uh, issue, which is the, um, uh, it's the uh, <clears throat> Mechanics Bank in the city of New York. It's also a counterfeit. It has, however, a colored panel on the front and also on the back, which is, uh, in this case, is just a simple panel. It's just an overprint with a cutout to show the building of the ship that's on the, the central vignette. And it still was counterfeited in spite of the fact that they had this as an anti counterfeiting device. And there's the back of it, it says counterfeit right on the back again. <clears throat> and we go on to the next one. 
This is one of the notes that was uh, issued by Murray Draper, Fairman and Company. They printed U.S. Treasury notes of 1815. And they, they, these are actually uh, bond payments. And notice it says uh, $3 in all payments or to fund the amount at 7% interest on request agreeably to the Act of Congress, February 28th, 1865, 18, 1815. Yeah. yeah, that's a weird note. And these things were effectively the first paper money issued by the, the federal government since the revolution because of the, the bad taste left by the, the uh, collapse of the continental dollars. Right. Here we have another note, again by the same company. It's a $10 note, again by the Treasury note, of, and it's the date of uh, February 24th, 1815. And uh, similar, similar denomination meant to circulate as money, because there was a real shortage. And $50 note, this has got a big cancellation hole right in the middle of it. Uh, but it does show that it was used as money. And here we have the Bank of Virginia at Norfolk, 1815, $5 note. And, <clears throat> and we have another note that's just behind it. It's come popping up in a minute. There it is, it's a 10 cent note, the Treasury of North Carolina at Raleigh. And this is an 1817 note. And that, pretty much uh, sh shows the early notes that I have in, in this uh, early obsolete notes. And it'll be later obsolete notes, which I'll talk about later. This shows a chart of the banks that were opened by state up until 1806. And it shows the accumulative progression of banks starting in 1782 with the Bank of North America, 1784 with the Bank of Massachusetts, and all the way up to 1800. And then in 1806, it shows all of the banks in this chart to the left. So it shows that there was a, there was a slow progression up until about 1792, and then another slow progression up until about 1800, and then things took, things took off after 1800 to 1806. Factories, factors responsible for the growth of new banks was progression of increasing, increasing needs for capital at the local, state, and federal levels. Capital was needed for buying public lands and for selling and repurchasing small par parcels. Some called it rampant speculation, but that is actually how the towns, farms, and ranches are created so that the farmers can afford them. Increasing trade by providing loans to merchant traders to buy and outfit ships. Tremendous needs for internal improvements such as roads, plank roads, canals, and ultimately railroads and harbors. Increased agricultural needs for cultivated land for local and export crops in the South. These were cotton, rice, and tobacco. New methods of agriculture production and crop processing meant new capital needs. Intensive capital needs for manufacturing, expansion of space, buildings, machinery, and transportation. New states entering the union and their needs for capital. And all of this has to be done during good times because during panic times, none of this is gonna be happening very easily. Yeah, and without the paper money to do this, nothing could have happened because it, you have to remember that all during this early period, we still didn't have any sources of gold or silver. Right, and so the factors affecting the access to capital is a, that exact statement. Insufficient amount of specie nationwide to further economic goals. Need to supplement specie with paper currency that was needed to promote growth. Wild excursions in the economy from feast good times to famine, hard times. Continuing cyclical occurrences of panics, now called depressions. About every 20 years, 1818, 1837, 1857, 1873, 1893, 1907, 1929, it's just a progression of roughly 20 years. Panics were hastened by large financial institutions such as banks and insurance companies and later companies like railroads falling, failing or going out of, going out of business or bankrupt. Falling somewhere between panics for periods of better times 
often accompanied by irrational exuberance, excessive borrowing, and easy credit. Competition with federal higher higher priority needs such as waging war, defending the country, advancing national priorities, expansion of the frontier, all were needed. And the, the states had to compete with that as well. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the printing of early notes. Printing of a minority of early notes was accomplished in a traditional manner as were newspapers and other legal documents of the time. Typeset with simple decorations. One of the exceptions to that was the Bank of North America, which was actually a copper sheet um, and, and it was designed in its entirety. So uh, <clears throat> they weren't done a little piece at a time like most of these others I'm talking about. <clears throat> and, and security features to prevent counterfeiting were severely lacking. Some featured the same measures as colonial revolutionary periods. You know, um, mis misspelled, deliberately misspelled things, or different colors, um, and also watermarks. Many of the early notes used copper plates just containing the details of the banking information in its, in its entirety. These plates could be used for several thousand impressions before wearing out. It took six months to engrave the six plates, $10, $20, 30 50 100 and the back plate for the 1784 issues of the Bank of North America. This model of creating a single plate for the entire note was inefficient for the printer, time consuming and expensive. When fake notes appeared, there was an unacceptable delay in recalling the compromise issue and reissuing it as a replacement. And occasionally there was an additional engraved plate that was used for color overprint adding another security feature. Watermarks in the paper were another deterrent to easy fakes. And in other cases, engraved plates of steel were used to give an increased plate life of about twice that of copper. This reduced the cost, but didn't address the other disadvantages of a single engraved plate. Uh, here we come to Jacob Perkins, banknote uh, printer. Born in 1766, died in 1849. He was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts, I was apprenticed to a goldsmith named Davis, making gold beads. At age 15, he took over Davis's business and expanded it to making shoe buckles when Davis had died. He had an aptitude for inventing things and had 21 American and 19 British patents. Not all of these patents had anything to do with money. He uh, invented an early version of a refrigerator at one time. Um, <clears throat> his inventions pertinent to banknote production were the permanent stereotype steel plate. And I'll show you an example of that um, on the next slide. In 1805, he, he, and in 1813, he invented stereography, also known as a transfer roll process for making steel printing plates and vice versa. The lower uh, illustration on the right shows a transfer being accomplished on a, on a roll. And with a, with a, it's on a steel, high, high pressure steel press making that transfer take place. Um, Sinterography was a monumental invention still being used today 200 years after its invention. An example of his PSSP as it became to be known is shown on the next slide. Plates had sections for an image at one end, two in the center for the bank name, and a city which when completed could give an order. Uh-oh. Uh, yep, there we go. I know what happened. Uh. Anyway, <laughs> um, to print, print a four subject image, he would be assembled with single plates in a larger lockable frame his plates had the advantage that for a new job, he had only to replace the slugs for the bank name, town, and the end and the image were a new, with a new design. Great efficiency, the design elements were simple, allowing counterfeits to ply the trade. Okay, so here we have a PSSP plate for the uh, Bank of Detroit Bank. And we have, I have color coded this so you can see the various elements on the plate because on the actual plate, 
in without the color coding it's hard to figure it out but the green elements are uh, slugs that make up uh, the that tell about the location Michigan Detroit and Detroit Bank the blue areas show the three slugs show the slugs spilling out to the domination five five dollars five dollars it's the larger of the two also providing space for a serial number to be written in after after um, gold areas show the slugs with the denomination counters five and an a for the plate position so there's a on each end there's a five and both have an a position notice they're not the same shape but they are Basically, one is derived from the other. The yellow areas show two differently designed slugs, making the top and bottom edges complete. The natural paper color has room for the legal obligation, space to fill in a bearer and the date of issue, and signatures of the cashier and president. The entire background consists of micro, micro lettering, which spells out the denomination, which is five. Here we have the actual plate um, that I had is uncolored, shows it how it normally would look. Um, this bank, uh, I will talk about the Detroit Bank briefly because I have some notes on it. Detroit Bank is an idea suggested by Boston financier William Sturgis and was sold to Woodward and Hill Hall as a need to export, need to have the bank to export Michigan furs and beaver to the east instead of to local markets in Ottawa and Quebec. Well, this, this was an idea that appealed to those two gentlemen. One was the, uh, Hull was the territorial governor and uh, the Woodward was one of three judges, the territorial judges. And they wanted, they're, they're, they were altruistic. They wanted to have bragging rights about how advanced uh, Michigan and Michigan was and its ability to appeal to a wider audience in the East for investment, immigration, and expansion. A bank char charter for 101 years was granted with capital up to a million dollars, three quarters of which was supposedly <clears throat> subscribed to. I don't think any of that money was paid in. Subscribed is one thing, paid in is another. A suitable lot was procured for $475 and the bank building costing $8,100 was completed. Woodward was named president and William Flanagan named cashier. It commenced operations in 1806. It ceased operations in 1806 as a deposit and discount bank. But of course there were no forthcoming deposits and also no loans to discount. The majority of the habitats of Michigan at the time were French whose main occupation was hunting and trapping. They had no need for banking. Meanwhile, bank notes of, the total number of bank notes of $140,000 were received and signed and sent off to Boston for distribution. After realizing that they were duped, Woodward and, Woodward resigned and Governor Hall withdrew from the bank. Detroit Bank became notorious as one of the earliest and largest fraudulent banks in the nation and synonymous with Michigan banking for a generation. This is an early note that most people could afford because there were so many of them out there that were unredeemed and they're in pretty decent shape. So I have a, a note similar to this in my collection that I paid like probably $150 for. I don't think you can find another note of that, this era that it would be that cheap. Here's another uh, in, uh, Perkins demonstration note that he printed while he was in England. He started a business, um, Fairman and Heath, along with Perkins, in 1819 to print uh, currency in London. And he used this to sell, to win a prize and to sell currency to those that wanted to have their currency printed. This is a great note for its age beautiful look. Uh, it's just a superb looking note for the time. 
We're going to talk about other early banknote printers. This is the Murray Draper and Fairman Company. The company was formed in Philadelphia, George Murray and John Draper and Gideon Fairman's association with Jacob Perkins in printing the penmanship copy book. Perkins and Fairman's running hand stereography, stereographic copies in 1810 and had temporarily ended. Draper joined Murray in 1810 and Fairman having had banknote engravings book experience with Perkins in 1810. MDF was printing certain U.S. Treasury bonds, as we saw previously, starting in 1814 and continuing in 1815. Partnership was dissolved in 1817 when Draper left and the firm now became Murray Fairman and Company. Murray died in 1822. Draper rejoined the firm, taking on Thomas Underwood, with the firm now being called Fairman, Draper, and Underwood. Fairman was also part in partnership with Britain, in Britain with Perkins, Fairman, and Heath in 1817. Fairman died in 1827, and the firm changed to Draper, Underwood, and Company. <clears throat> okay, here we go to see some of the banknotes of Murray, Draper, and Fairman. So this is a, an early note. It's a it's a, a proof note. That was again in uh, Heritage Sale at uh, the Bank of Washington. Uh, it looks to be a, a note of about the early 1820s. <clears throat> and it's a nice looking note. Uh, it's a little more complicated than the earlier notes that you saw that were the earliest notes. Here's another note, uh, Bank of Alexandria. This is a little more simple note. Probably not quite as early, uh, probably more like 18, 18, 19, somewhere there. And here we have the last note, which is dated at 1817, 1811. And sure, you can see how early that note looks. Um, uh, it, certainly the other two notes look much greater and would be more difficult to counterfeit. It's, it's always about a race between the counterfeiters and the and the note producers at this point, and you you start to see real changes, right? Right. Uh, <clears throat> here we have a um, uh, the bank, American Bank Note Company, which was the largest bank uh, in enterprise in the country at the time that it was founded, which is 1858, and. Uh, <clears throat> The company was made up of seven existing banknote printers, and the Panic of 1857 was a tipping point for former competitors to combine and pool their talents and assets. There was a need for safeguarding the tools of the trade, dies, plates, processes, printed banknotes and records, customer approved proofs, progressive trials, proofs and the like. The printers enlisted here in declining ownership in the association were Rodden, Wright, Hatch, and Edson had the lion's share. Toppin, Carpenter and Company, Danforth, Perkins and Company, Bald, Cosland and Company, Joslin, Draper, Welsh and Company, Wellstood, Hay and Whiting, and a man named John Gavitt for 498 shares. And the Secretary of the New York State Clearinghouse got 20 shares for being a good guy. <laughs> Uh, the total number of shares was 29,800. There were 4,880 unissued shares, and they cost $50 for $1,490,000. This was a large amount of money at the time for a big enterprise. Um, back to the American Banknote Company, the largest remaining competitor to the American Banknote Company during the Civil War joined forces with them by incorporating the NBC National Bank Note Company into that organization in 1879. By 1867, there was no business to provide bank notes to any U.S. state chartered banks because of the federal tax on state banks, issues of currency. The 1879 date for joining 1858 American Banknote Company does seem to be quite late with the handwriting being on the wall since 1866. The American Banknote Company had expanded their foreign business 
especially in the Americas, to almost monopoly status during that time. U.S. business was limited mostly to security printing of stocks and bonds. Other improvements to printing for better uniformity and security. Um, the more printers are using geometric lathes for counters, edge, and side panel designs, making make notes using them appear more uniform, setting them apart from inferior counterfeiting attempts. Instead of stopping the production of fakes, spurred on more serious contenders in faking notes when they got a hold of the machines. More elaborate designs, especially those of allegorical style with multiple figures, many of which were caught interacting with each other. Ultimately, the better engraved that the note was, the very finest style, the more difficult it was to counterfeit. Invention and the wild, wide use, spread use of the medallion, ruling engine, engine by engravers to stimulate quasi three dimensional designs. This was again a method to improve the look of the portraiture as an aid to deter counterfeiting. Increase the use of large and sweeping scenes as if an artist was planning to portray on a canvas a continuous grand scene. Heretofore, banknotes were composed of very small design elements, each of which would have been easy to duplicate, or portraits, part full figure images that were now were small and easily copied. Wider use of color over and under prints, especially spelling out the de de denominations in large letters, the sum being mirror image and printed on the back of the note. Special anti-counterfeiting inks to prevent photo reproduction were used, but gradually fell out of favor as being ineffective for their claimed purpose. The later use of cycloidal config configuration scheme for counters, panels, underprints, uh, as perfected by the National Bank Note Company, 1860s, made their notes extremely difficult to duplicate. And here we have uh, banknotes showing these six uh, different uh, techniques. This is a medallion ruling engine. And you can see that we have a quasi three-dimensional image at the left side and the right side. Uh, and these have extremely 3, 3D-like appearances. And also the counters at say five, right above Northampton Bank. This is a note from my collection. Uh, it's not in the best condition, but it was an example that I wanted to show. Here's another one that shows the same thing. Because it's a proof, it shows these details much clearer. Uh, this is the Merchants Bank of Salem, Mass. Again, we have $10 note. We have the panel in the left, and have the one on the right that says 10. And we have the uh, two that have the counters right above the X's, which is another counter, which is another style of that same pro process. And I'll show you that on the next slide. And one of the things that's interesting, Dick, is that one of the questions is how common were fraudulent notes at this time? And the reason why this became such a big deal and why technology was advancing was because up to 50% of the uh, obsolete notes in circulation in the 1850 era were counterfeit. And so it was a very big deal yeah. um, and occupied for a good reason, a lot of time and effort. Right. So here we have the last note of that series showing the medallion ruling engine that shows a counters of 100 in every place. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, uh, an image except for the eagle in the, in the, in the, in the middle. Uh, now we'll go on to another technique, which is allegorical style and multiple figures. You see, we have some multiple figures. Uh, again, it's, there's some uh, a ruling type engine there and multiple figures. This is a, a canal and banking company, $5 note from New Orleans. It's again out of my own collection and kind of, uh, uh, was looking for another note of the same style, which I didn't find. Now this one shows an example of allegorical styles in multiple figures. And again, it's a big, big figures going across the whole canvas of the note. 
This happens to be a note of uh, Minnesota is Lyman Dayton, who was one of the early governors. Here we have another one that is very similar and it shows four figures. And uh, it's the Bank of uh, East Tennessee at Knoxville. <clears throat> and uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's a very uh, complicated looking scene not easily started in it for, if you want to reproduce this scene, you're just going to have to do a lot of work. Yeah. Um, the Hollyoke Bank, it shows the counter on the right, which is one of these um, uh, ruling engines, medallion ruling engine that created that three-dimensional looking five counter that holds the five and the V's down below, uh, the same thing. And again, it's another big scene on the left uh, of an Indian family, American Native family. In response to one of the questions too is, you can tell who printed these notes because all of these notes include somewhere, normally at the bottom underneath the, the right. main design, the name of the printers. Yeah, this, so, one, this one says Danforth and Huffy, New York publishers. So they, 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 they that was one of their signatures. Okay, now we have a medallion ruling figure of a large size, number two on the right, the lady that's holding that too, that, that's a medallion ruling figure. And we have a very large uh, in, uh, Native American canoe on the left side. Nice looking note. It has a color overprint uh, for, the, for the denomination of two. Here's another, uh, Here's another bank uh, note that technique that shows extensive use of in special inks and color tints. This one has a, it says at the lower left, right under the big five patent, patent green tint. And this was done uh, by the Merchants Bank of South Carolina at Chira. And this is a <coughs> printed by Rod and Wright, Hatch, and Edson. Edson's. Boy, hey, Edson. Yep. Here we have another beautiful green trend and a beautiful uh, note. This is the American Bank of the state of Maryland. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it has, it's a remainder. And again, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, Cowsland, Bald Cowsland, and Willard. Or, I can't. I no, can't. Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. And then we'll go to the next tent, which is a multicolor tent. It has green and red tent. Nice vignette at the left. A vignette, a uh, nice center vignette with a lady sitting in the five. And on the right hand side, we have uh, two, two young girls, a baby and a young girl. And this is from the city, Bank of the City of Pitts, Petersburg in 1860. So this is an early uh, Civil War piece. Finally, we have a, uh, a <coughs> extensive use of special inks and color tints. This is what's called a double uh, tinted type of uh, overlay. It has this dark red, and then there's a, there's a laced uh, that shows where the tint is, and that, that's the, another a part of the tinting. I don't have the back of this one. And here we have another tint that's a more, more, more conventional tint this was by Ball, Ball, Cosland and Company, New York. So these are ways to, and look at the detail down in the uh, vignettes on the left and right. They almost look like photographs. And we have this big scene in the middle with a big, uh, uh, at the lower part of the C, with the C stands for a $100 C note. And uh, that's a century note. And uh, we have these four individuals there that are uh, <clears throat> interacting together. 
Here we have the uh, grand sweeping scene uh, that was mentioned. It's a uh, it's the Indian um, Native American spearing a buffalo, bison, uh, beaver, and a state uh, state seal of Wisconsin that is for the banks, and uh, it has a nice red tint to it. Uh, pretty modern. This is. Um, Toppin Carpenter, part of the American Banknote Company. It doesn't say it's American Banknote, but it is. Here we have the Bank of Mishawaka. Again, a beautiful scene on the left with uh, 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 cows, cattle, taking a rest, maybe on a drive or at the end of the day. Uh, again, a very large scene. We have an overprint of one. Uh, and we have the registered of the auditor's office in Indiana for at the Oval. Uh, and finally, we have a artistic view, you, the artistic use of the grand sweeping scene. This is just one continuous scene across the whole note. This is a note by uh, Ormsby. And he was famous for this kind of thing at the end of his uh, engraving career. This is from Fort Leavenworth. There's another bank note that looks just like this from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. <clears throat> Finally, we come to the uh, last of the uh, <clears throat> improvements uh, for anti-counterfeiting. We're talking about cycladal configuration for counters. <coughs> Excuse me. And the, the counters, you see how detailed they are at uh, for the X and for the 10. Okay, and then we have another note that's behind this note that shows the back, I believe. Well, you didn't get, didn't get that, huh? No. Okay, well, we don't have that. But the cycloidal part refers to the red tint <clears throat> that's covering the bottom third, the bottom half of the note. And that's a panel cycloidal. <clears throat> it repeats the same uh, pattern over and over again, which says Citizens Bank of Louisiana, and I think it says it in French. So <clears throat> that's, that's a unique, uh, unique note. Now we'll just go on to the next slide, which is shows the bank information by state, state chartered banks, I mean and uh, legal functions and so forth. What was interesting about this when I looked at the data and I thought, well, this, this could be right, could be wrong, but it's done by the United States Census and I got the banks out of the uh, Haxby uh, set. The uh, Iowa looked a little peculiar because I had two banks and I had 168 people employed. Well, it turns out there's 15 different branches of the State Bank of Iowa State Bank of Iowa was a un unique single bank in Iowa that took care of all the banking needs. That explains that. So we have these for each state, and I'm not going to show all these now because I want to get to the next. <clears throat> and we're going to go to fractional currency. And we got five minutes to do that. So uh, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> maybe. Anyway. Fractional currency was authorized by Congress on March 3rd, 1863. When the U.S. Civil War was declared, hoarding of small change started almost immediately, causing much harm to small businesses who charged only small prices for their wares. The shortage of cents was alleviated by private issues of patriotic tokens, and that helped cents. The Treasury officials allowed postage stamps to be used as small change and for payments up to $5. The Postal Department refused to accept circulated stamps, although technically uncanceled, due to their deplorable condition. Couldn't be used for stamps anymore, most of them. Most merchants agreed. An enterprising John Galt started making brass cases with mica window and selling them to businesses with their advertisements on them at a discount. This worked for a while until the postal department complained about running out of stamps. Nearly 750,000 stamps were diverted to Gall's cause. Francis Spinner 
Treasury of the U.S. proposed creating a postage currency in multiple denominations with stamp designs on the face, but no gum on the back. This was the first issue of fractional currency labeled as postage currency on the notes. <clears throat> the faces were printed by the National Banknote Company while the backs were done by the American Banknote Company. Two versions were made, with the first having perforated sides like stamps and the second with straight edges like currency. Backs came with and without the logo of the American Banknote Company, ABNCO. The five and 25 cent issues have images of Thomas Jefferson as it appeared on the five cent stamp and were both printed in brown ink on buff colored paper. 10 and 50 cent issues have images of George Washington as they appeared on the 10 cent stamp and were both printed in green ink on white paper. And the uh, last is sizes, five and 10 cents, 65 by 45 millimeters, 25 and 50 cents, 78 by 48. So here we have the front and back, face and back of the five cent note. Notice it has the, the monogram of American Banknote Company on the back at the right. Here we have a 10 cent uh, Washington. Again, we have the American Banknote Company at the right. And these are both, these issues were perforated. They do come in unperforated versions. Here's an unperforated version of the 25 cent stamp with the monogram. And we have the 50 cent. This happens to be a perforated version with the, with the uh, monogram. Second issue, this issue was very first printed entirely by the fledgling Bureau of Printing and Engraving as it came to be known later. <clears throat> same denominations were as the first, 5, 10, 25, and 50 cent. All notes were the same size, 66 by 48. That was probably not a good idea, but they did it. Same design was printed on the face of all the denominations. The portrait of Washington at the center against the background of commerce and industry. The same patriotic shield <clears throat> was printed on the back with large numerals for each denomination. Back colors are brown, green, purple, and red in ascending denomination order. Any counterfeiting features included an overprinted bronze ink oval around the portrait on the face, overprinted bronze ink numerals for the denomination on the back. Later, bronze surcharges were needed, added to two, three, or all four back corners as another secure feature. <clears throat> okay, we have no surcharges on the back other than the five. This is the five, five cent Washington note. Here we have the 10 cent <coughs> Washington note. It has surcharges at the lower and right hand corner. And we have the 25 cent note. It has a four, surcharge at all four corners on the back. And the 50 cent note has four surcharges in all, each corner. <coughs> Here we have the third issue. Uh, six issues were designed, but the 50 cent issue was not released for circulation due to the law passed in 1866 prohibiting living portraits from appearing on government securities. The further release of the five cent issue bearing the portrait of Spencer Clark was then halted because he was a living official in the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. All designs, both face and back, were unique. Faces shown in the image of three and, uh, three and 10 cent were Washington, five cent Clark, 25 cent Fessenden, Secretary of the Treasury, 50 cent Justice, and later Spinner. Backs of red and green color are found in all denominations except the three cent. Besides the back note, the 50 cent Spinner issues have two different designs. <clears throat> On the second issues, the backs of the second and 50 cent notes have various surcharges, and the five cent notes had a small A engraved in the first column of the subject, and 10 cent had a small one in the first column. 25 and both 50 cent had small A's in the first and, row, and ones in the first column. 
again, this is another anti-counterfeiting device. Only known to probably the people at the BEP at the time. All denominations are of different sizes. There's no word sense on the 10 cent note. Here we have the three cent note. And there's two types of backgrounds. There's a light background and a darker background. This is the darker background behind Washington. There we have Spencer Clark, front and face and back. There we have Washington. It has surcharges on it, on face and back. Here we have Fessenden. They have surcharges on the right. Here's Fessenden's back which has a surcharge on it. <clears throat> Here's Spinner, which has the surcharges the right and left. And here's the back. Of, this is actually the second back for uh, Spinner. This is, a, this is the justice issue. And uh, it shows the surcharges on the right and left. This is a, this is a red back and so show surcharges in four corners, A256. <clears throat> and there should be a green one just like that, but I see it didn't make it. <laughs> so there would be, for the 50 cent of the third issue, there's three different backs, two of them are colored, one of them is a different design completely. And with that, I think we're just gonna leave it. Uh, we'll take some questions for the next time. Great. Well, thank you, Doug and Richard. I'm going to head, go send out the uh, survey right now. If you could please fill that out um, and be honest with your answers so we know how we can change this before you um, leave for the day. So a few questions. Um, Doug, you may be able to help answer this. Have you answered any of the questions that have come in or do you want me to just start back where I was at? I, I did answer a, a few of them. Uh, how common were the fraudulent notes and and how can you tell which companies printed each note? Okay, do you want to pick up where you left off then? Sure, uh, so one question is, when purchasing obsolete banknotes, how do you know if they are actual notes without being certified by a grading company? I would say you have to look very carefully. Yeah, it, it can be difficult. There, there are some telltale signs. I mean, usually it has to do more with whether it's a good quality copy or a bad quality copy. Um, but uh, the, you know, counterfeits of the time are actually very collectible so that they're not a problem. It's the modern counterfeits that you're worried about. And usually the modern counterfeits uh, appear in paper that's completely different than the original paper. And usually they make mistakes with the ink. In particular, the signatures tend to be a black ink the same as the printing. And at the time, the signatures were done by hand using a gall ink, which turns brown or gray, uh, does not look like the printing portions. Some of, the, some of the earlier ones had different colored inks, some red ink, some blue ink. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> if you have just plain black, looks like everything else is probably not the real thing. And then another question was, which are the most valuable original or counterfeit? It, it depends on the issues yeah. in a lot of ways. Uh, some counterfeits can be quite rare and interesting in and of themselves. I mean, generally speaking, you want the originals, but for this period, they are so historical and so part of the story that uh, it's not necessarily true to say one or the other across the board. It's a case by case basis. So Doug, I'm seeing some questions come through the Q&A. It looks like one of them that um, came through when Richard started talking was, how do the values of regular issues and remainder notes compare? Well, the remainder note is a common uh, usually a co more common note than an original note. And uh, <clears throat> for people that want to collect notes of greater rarity, notice I said rarity, not necessarily value, uh, you would get the original note if you had a choice of getting a good original note or just a perfect uh, example of a remainder note. 
All right. How can you tell it's a counterfeit other than practice and expertise? Are there telltale signs? We just discussed some of those with mm -hmm. the ink color and, and things like that, the paper type. Unfortunately, most of the counterfeits that are available are in wretched condition and they would not show up well on the slide. It's the sort of thing that when we have our regular class, we hand around cover counterfeits so that you can look at them and see what they look like. In face, hands on. Yeah, that makes all the difference with, with that kind of thing. With any type of counterfeiting, you really need to be able to compare the genuine with the counterfeits to see what the differences are. All right, another one, maybe you've answered this, maybe not. Why is there so much writing on the bills? Yeah, we, we answered that in the in previous thing. But basically it has to do with, A, it's expensive to do designs, but B, uh, it's, it's a way of, of creating confidence. They're, they're basically explaining why this note is worth something. Uh, it, it reflects the idea that these notes are all substitutes for real money. How can I start a collection of these banknotes? For what? How can I start a collection of these banknotes? Um, <laughs> well, I, I would suggest that you go to a, a coin show and see what they have available. Another one is to uh, frequent online auctions, especially from the larger companies like Stack Bowers, Heritage, Lynn Knight, those firms. Yeah, the, the notes, you, you, obsolete notes in general are common as a group. You find a lot of them out there for sale. Uh, individually, the, the individual issues from different banks can be extremely rare, but there's still a lot of the notes as a whole out there. So it's a matter of they're around. It's if you get specific that they can get very hard to obtain. All right, let's answer two more questions. Um, where did these early banks get so much money, like $10 million, et cetera? Uh, many of the people that were part of our group of patriots and businessmen were businessmen and they had capital to put that kind of money into a bank. Now realize that a bank might have as many as 50 shareholders or 100 shareholders. So when we talk about $450,000, we're talking about dis distributing that over maybe a 100 people or so. So it's not so much that they have a bunch of money each, but that they contribute their, their share. Also, you have to realize that at the time, we talked about the growing disparity between the rich and the poor in, in our current time, but actually in reality, compared to what it was like in 1700, 1800, and 1900, the difference between the haves and haves nots was much greater than it is today uh, overall. Um, so when you had a group of investors that were uh, part of the very elite of the country, they, they had a lot of money compared to, you know, the average income of, a, of somebody in 1800 in the U.S. would have been somewhere between, you know, 50 and $75 a year. And some of these guys were making uh, tens of thousands, if not more money in that time frame. And they, they had accumulated wealth of $100,000. That's a huge difference. All right, let's do one more question. Um, how common were fraudulent banknotes? Very common. Very common. Uh, they, in fact, we didn't even talk about one phase of uh, banknote detection, and that is the banknote reporters. They had literally dozens of magazines, which I would call magazine today, but they were a multiple page uh, newspaper every week that would come out with different fraudulent banknotes and their dis supposed designs. The problem with the banknote reporters, it helped probably the, the fraudulent um, issuers more than it helped anybody else. Because by the time the news came out that they were fraudulent, uh, they probably had moved on to a different fraudulent bank note. So 
it's a it's an interesting story, but we didn't talk about those at all because we didn't have time to. So, uh, you know, it's just one of those things that uh, people, if you wanted to have a uh, some idea, if you were a merchant, you had to have a banknote reporter. If you were in a big city, it was more helpful than being in a small city uh, to have those to find out what was going on. Um, but it was very, very, probably 50% of the notes were fraudulent. Great. Well, thank you, Doug and Richard. We really appreciate your time on this subject. Um, if you are planning to jump on to the next presentation, which is understanding the um, art of rare coin submissions, that'll be starting up in 25 minutes. So once I close this one, I'll be opening that one up. Um, we have a certificate, certificate of appreciation coming for you and Richard, so, excuse me, Doug and Richard, so we appreciate everything you have done. Um, I did put the link to all of the um, future e-learnings just in the chat, and there is a link in that link for the recorded ones. It looks like we only have one of the recorded classes on there right now. We'll be getting the rest on there very soon. So thank you everybody for participating today. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you haven't finished the um, survey, please do so before you disconnect and we'll see everybody soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.